Thank you. Hi. Thanks for coming. Check one two, hey check, hey hey hey, check check check, one two three. Do you want to try these? Okay, so you're feeling good. Hello, how you doing? Well, that going in your belt or in your pocket? That's great, thank you. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Is it good? Yeah. Okay, I'll get started. Uh, thank you for finding the room, and thank you for being here. I'm Russ Tedrake. You're in underactuated robotics. Your TAs here in the almost front row are Pete. Raise your hand, Pete. Yeah. And Greg. They're fantastic. You're going to love them. Uh, you're in good hands. The course website, we're going to just have everything digital. We're not going to hand anything out. The course website is underactuated.mit.edu or underactuated.ccl, but this is fine. Uh, and this is the textbook. 
This is the, all the materials for this particular version of the course, which includes you know, the grading policy, for instance. I'll remind you at the end to make sure you take a look. It includes the link to Piazza and a couple of things that will do, get it administratively out of the way and the problem sets and the like um, <clears throat> soon. Okay, so my goals for today are to, well, first and foremost, you have to leave the room uh, with an understanding of what the class title means. Okay, that uh, that's, sounds like a modest goal, but it, you, you need to be able to answer if someone approaches you in the street and asks you what does underactuated robotics mean. Okay, and I'll give you a few different ways you could answer that question. Uh, we'll, we'll do that partly with some fun videos because Roboticists have lots of fun videos. That's sort of why we do what we do, maybe. And uh, uh, that'll give us some background and some motivation. And then I'll do a little bit of, of definitions. Uh, that'll expose you maybe to the type of, of math that we'll do in the class, so you get a sense for what, it, what, what that's going to look like. I'll give you at least one technical idea in the feedback linearization, I'd, and then introduce the manipulator equations. If we have time, I'll do the rest of the course. Uh, I'll just I'll give you a sort of a whirlwind through what you're going to learn this term. All right, so um, I thought the right way to start would be to tell you how I got to thinking about underactuated robotics when I got here. So um, I came to MIT. I ended up uh, as a grad student. I had been in computer science, computer engineering. I always wanted to do robotics. I got here, and uh, there were some great robotics labs. One of them was the Leg Laboratory, which is an extremely famous lab, right? Uh, it was famous back in the 1980s when Mark Raybert started by... Um, building a series of hopping robots, which were uh, jaw-dropping at the time, because uh, before these robots came online, the robot, the best locomotion robots in the world, moved like this, right? They, they would put all their weight on one foot, they'd sort of slowly put their next foot down, they'd go like this. Even that they didn't do super well. Uh, Raybird came around and started building a series of robots that just threw themselves through the air with reckless abandon and really, I think, changed the way people thought about how legs should work in robotics. He actually wrote a beautiful series of papers back then uh, about how to run on two legs as though they were one and then how to, how to run on four legs as though it was one. And he even had a quadruped, you'll see in a minute, back in the early 80s, because we're doing flips. Okay, uh, if you've seen the more recent Boston Dynamics video of a doing a flip, that was sort of a, call, a throwback to this. Uh, this was the, the early quadruped. Just absolutely amazing robots back in the early 80s. The, the controllers that underlie this are still sort of the, the, the stuff that makes the controllers at Boston Dynamics hum, right? Just absolutely amazing. Mark had already gone. He had started Boston Dynamics, or he was, he had started Boston Dynamics as a software company. I was actually a, uh, a grad student sitting in the basement of the, uh, of the old AI building when Mark came by one day and he pointed at that old treadmill which was sitting in the corner. He said, are you guys using that? We're gonna start doing robots again at Boston Dynamics. Uh, and, and the rest there is history. <clears throat> Uh, but the other robot that was happening then at the Leg Lab, which uh, was the reason I came to MIT, was this robot Trudy. I don't know if anybody would remember Trudy, but Pete Dilworth was hacking in the corner of the basement of NE43 on this just beautiful dinosaur robot. Completely captured my imagination. Robot videos, especially the older robot videos, always have cheap. why I started doing robotics like this, okay? Those little guys there. <clears throat> the other thing that happened when I was sitting in the basement of the leg laboratory at MIT is uh, Honda made a big announcement, right? So more, more good old 80s music. Uh, this is actually the 90s now. So Honda told us in the late 90s, 
surprise, we've actually been working behind closed doors on walking robots for a long time. And they showed up with a robot that was called P2 at the time. It was quickly followed by the robot P3 and then Asimo, which you probably know today. And to be sitting in the leg laboratory, you know, one of the top premier labs in the world working on walking robots like Fruity, and to see this come out, it was kind of <laughs> what? You're kidding me, because this robot's walking around beautifully, untethered, uh, up and down stairs, incredible things for a late 90s robot. Okay, so I hope when you watch that, your reaction first is, oh my god, that's incredibly impressive. In fact, the best walking robots today are only moderately better. The second thing I hope you understand, I hope you think about as you watch these more, is that that's not walking anything like a human. Right? It's, uh, it's something looks really goofy about that cake. In particular, there's a stereotypical humanoid gait where you keep your center of mass flat, you keep your uh, your feet flat, and you have this sort of lumbering humanoid gait. And we'll all talk about all the reasons why that is when we get to the humanoid thing. Okay, but this is an example, in some ways, of what happens if you take robotic arm technology and put it on the walking robot. And what actually there's, the controller is doing is it's doing a ton of work to actively cancel out the natural dynamics of the robot so that it can impose a strict trajectory tracking controller on the legs of those robots so it knows exactly where it is at all times. Right around the same time I was learning about this other approach to walking robots. It's called passive dynamic walking. This is a robot. It actually doesn't have a computer, doesn't have a motor, doesn't have a controller, doesn't have a battery at all. It's just falling down a ramp powered only by gravity, but you probably say it walks more naturally than Asimo. It's certainly more energy efficient. Right, watch the, that's just a glorified slinky. It's called a passive dynamic walker, right? So this is the dichotomy I want you to see in the class, right? So the goal of thinking about dynamics in robotics is that we can do better. In fact, I think when animals move, they do better. They don't try to cancel out everything about the, that the world's trying to do, them in or, do to them in order to actively stabilize their system. They actually let gravity do a lot of the work. They let physics do a lot of the work. That's a scary, fundamentally hard thing to do because it means you have to relinquish control to the world. You have to trust that the world's gonna do what you want it to do and then just push it along a little bit to make it uh, bend to your will. That's a theme that we're gonna carry out throughout the course. Okay, so now there's cool robots too. I put the, uh, the backflip robot, which is my favorite video of all time, uh, in the notes. So I put the, um, the cheetah up here, which is another incredibly amazing video. And so robotics is just in this incredible space right now where the hardware's gotten so good. Uh, the controllers are pretty good, but we'll talk about how you guys can help make them better. Um, and you know, AI's happening, there's funding like crazy. This is like a great time to be a roboticist. Okay, so that dichotomy I tried to call out of uh, ASIMO versus the passive dynamic walkers. Now, ASIMO, I don't want to diss ASIMO. ASIMO is one of the most amazing robots. It was, was absolutely pushed the field forward by, by an incredible amount. I just The control approach taken there was about controlling everything versus the passive dynamic walking approach, which is the opposite extreme. Neither of them are right by themselves. The answer's got to be somewhere in the middle. And it turns out that sort of same story plays out in lots of different um, domains. So if we uh, instead go to UAVs, if you care about aerial vehicles, it turns out if you look at the dichotomy of the way people do control for, for instance, an F-14, uh, F-14s do incredible things, right? They can, they can sit on their tail, some of them, they can land on an uh, aircraft carrier. Okay, but they actually, just like Asimo is confined to a pretty restrictive gait where its foot is flat on the ground, its center of mass is sort of in, in, stays on a plane because that's where we know how to do control. The aircraft is similarly restricted to a, a low angle of attack region of state space where, guess what, we know how to stabilize everything, we have enough control authority to stabilize everything, and we're able to completely control the physics of the air, aircraft. Right. 
Birds don't do that at all. Birds routinely go into very high angle of attack regimes where the fluid dynamics becomes much more complicated. They go into unsteady uh, fluid regimes. There's, there's this picture, if, you were, if it was brighter and taken uh, you know, a little better, you'd see actually some vortex uh, wake off the back of the, of the cardinal there because there was a little bit of smoke they put into the air. And you can see there's incredible sort of eddies and nonlinear effects happening in, in the dynamics of this bird as it lands on a perch, which they do all the time, right? The difference there is that when you're, when you're at a low angle of attack, right, the dynamics are simple, relatively. Small changes in angle of attack change, reflect small changes in control authority and, ch and small changes in the, you know, smooth changes in the dynamics of the aircraft. And when you, when you go to high angles of attack, everything breaks down. But of course, nature does that all the time. Let me see if this is going to play. So this is the barn owl landing on the, basically the camera. I think the way you do this is you put some meat in your hand or something right, right in the camera. Okay, but look at the leading, you know, the leading edge feathers of that bird as it comes up. There's clear separation, which is what you avoid at all costs if you're an aircraft designer. And this bird's doing it routinely. And in fact, if you watch the feathers from the other angle, they're doing just as crazy things. Okay, so. Unlike this idea where you should try to control everything, stay in a regime where you you have you can you know you're you're in complete command of your of your physics. Animals are always routinely going to regimes where the dynamics are hard, but actually they're being exploited because at the same time, both the reason those birds go into a very high angle of attack regime is that if you do create suction off the back of your wing, it acts like an air brake and it slows you down. Right. So if you have separation off the back of your wing, you have a pocket of low pressure right behind the wing and it pulls you backwards. So you'd like to be able to exploit those com com those ideas. You just have to do it by thinking about more complicated dynamics. Here's a version that we tried to do in lab. Uh, we started with complicated planes and boiled it down to a very simple plane. This is a foam glider we shot out of a catapult and see if, to try to see if this could land on a perch like a bird. And it goes into a very complicated, unsteady fluid regime. But sure enough, we can make it with good control. You can make it land on the perch basically every time. So we took a, a, some time to build a wind tunnel just to, to put, and we put some um, titanium tetrachloride on the leading edge of the wing just to make these pictures. That was a very hard-earned picture. I hope it's good. Uh, I also got in trouble with the administration and all kinds of stuff. But uh, uh, and now, by the end of it, we were convinced that we could pretty much throw this. Even though this has no propeller, no ailerons or anything, it has a single control, a, a single um, actuator commanding the tail. Uh, Joe's thesis was, I want to be able to throw that plane from any initial condition, and it always lands on the perch. And he got it. very convinced. Birds exploit their dynamics to incredible effect too, right? So, um, so the albatross can actually fly across the ocean basically without ever flapping its wings. It's incredibly efficient. Um, you can, there's, I've seen papers about the metabolic cost of, of these birds flying across the ocean. How, you, do, you know how they do it? They do uh, dynamic soaring over the ocean, right? So there's, a, there's wind over the ocean. The velocity of the wind at the surface has got to be the same as the velocity of the water. Up in the air, it's higher. So there's a gradient in the wind. They start flying back and forth on that gradient, and they can use the energy in the air to propel themselves forward. They don't actually have to flap their wings. It's awesome, okay? Um, people have done metabolic studies. It's hard because they're flying over the ocean, but they, they've done metabolic studies where they try to estimate how much energy these birds use, and uh, the absolute number doesn't really mean anything, but uh, uh, what's interesting is it uses about the same amount of energy when it's flying across the ocean as when it's sitting on the beach, okay? So it's either incredibly efficient on the beach, which is possible, or it's incredibly efficient in, in the ocean, and maybe, maybe both of those. Uh, the other thing that's remarkable is that not only are they extremely, you know, they're, they're, they're going into these regimes, but they're able to, when they're in these incredible high performance, very complicated fluid regimes, they're also able to do incredible things. So a peregrine falcon, they dive at 200 some miles an hour, they're still able to pull out and grab a swallow, right? Intercept something that's flying very nimbly to try to get away from it. So these things are just far beyond what we can do. Quad rotors are amazing now, right? Quad rotors, you see drone racing, you see all these kind of things. Um, but they're not amazing like this, right? Quad rotors are amazing, and even the Atlas backflip, they're amazing because 
they're using incredible amounts of power and control authority to do that, right? So a quadrotor racing is able to do dynamic things because you put big enough motors on there that your thrust to weight ratio is like a billion and, uh, and you can turn and, and, and do whatever you like with simple control. What's really elegant is if you turn those motors off or, or make, them, make small motors and try to do the same thing. I'd like to see you take a paper airplane, fold it up here, see if you can throw it to Harvard. You should be able to with a little bit of, of control, right? <laughs> this is another one. So uh, this is a hummingbird, okay? Uh, pretty cool, stabilizes its head in order to stick its, its mouth in the, in the feeder. The thing that's amazing about that video, you, you see it and I'll, I'll play it again here. It's a high-speed video slowed down. You see that little arrow up at the top? The airflow is, it's actually flying backwards at about 10 meters per second or something ridiculous, right? So there, it's in a wind tunnel where they're blasting air trying to perturb this thing. It's just sitting there, uh, you know, hanging out, getting its nectar. Uh, pretty cool. And then the best video of all time, in my opinion, that showcases the power of, of under-actuated dynamics. This is a series of experiments by George Lauder and Mike Trenafilu. Mike's in uh, mechanical engineering and ocean engineering, and George Lauder's at Harvard. This is a view from above of a rainbow trout, okay? It's a rainbow trout that they put in a water tunnel at the lab at Harvard. So rainbow trout, they thought, oh, this would be, might be an interesting experiment because rainbow trout seem to do something crazy at mating season. They swim upstream a lot. They tend to hang out behind rocks. What are they doing? We'd like to understand that a little better. So they took this rainbow trout. That was what free swimming looked like for the rainbow trout in the top corner. Now the second experiment is let's take that same rainbow trout and put it behind a rock, you know, a cylinder, half cylinder, in the water tunnel and see what that, that does, okay? So it completely changes the kinematics of its gait, right? So some, it's doing something sort of clever, and they actually called this the von Karman gait of the, of the um, trout because the hypothesis was that the, the von Karman wake, the, the vortices that are spinning off the back of the cylinders, were somehow, it was somehow finding a way to resonate behind, between those, those uh, vortices in order to somehow make itself more efficient. But they didn't know how efficient, you know, how efficient is this actually doing? So the key experiment, one of the best experiments of all time, at, well, not so good for the fish, but um, so now it's a dead fish, okay? There's a piece of string tying, uh, you know, a little, little piece of twine connecting the string to the, to the half cylinder, you know, because going back, getting caught in the grate, not good. But it's, it's, you'll see where there's sort of a limit of that string. And let's see what happens when you put a dead fish behind the cylinder. So it's flopping around a little bit, you know, like you'd expect a dead fish to do, I guess. That's the wake bouncing around. But then something crazy happens. That dead fish just swam upstream, right? Do you guys see that? That's what, the water's going that way. There's a cylinder there. Fish is hanging out, getting knocked around, and then it found its rhythm, and whoa, 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 dead fish just swam, swam upstream. Okay, so there's something even mechanical. That's not a controls thing. That's a, that's a mechanical thing, uh, that that dead fish is tuned to take advantage of the, the dynamics of the, of the problem so well that brains turned off, it still does its thing. Okay, so um, there's, there's everywhere you look in robotics, I think you're going to find this story. I'm a little biased, but there's a, there's a case where, you know, if you think about the dynamics, if you think about what we can do in robotics and what we can't do in robotics, a lot of times the dynamics of the problem is the missing component. So another example that we'll talk more about um, this year than I have in the past is about manipulation. So just to show a couple examples of manipulation, this is an example from uh, Si Wan Feng at TRI, who uh, has got a, a you know a, a, now a manipulation problem. This is actually not very dynamic, but it's got perception and everything in the loop, and it's able to sort of randomly pick out objects uh, based only on perception. You can throw any object sort of in the tray; it'll always pick it out. In fact. The experiment here is designed to be a long-running experiment so we can do lo lots and lots of systematic testing to, to make sure we have dynamic models which match between simulation and reality. And the software that you use for the course is beneficiary of that process. Okay, so perception is, uh, is a key part of manipulation that we won't talk that much about in this class, 
But dynamics is a huge part of manipulation too. And in fact, um, the thing I don't like about this video, and it's the same thing about almost every manipulation video you've ever seen, is that what we do is we enumerate, there's, the robot's allowed to touch the world here and here, okay? And then you do a lot of thinking about how do you go in and touch the world just there, and you do your, your task, okay? Um, what's missing from this and from a lot of experiments, there's almost no sense of feedback control in manipulation. If you look at the Amazon Robotics Challenge, where they're doing you know, the picking challenge, turned into the Robotics Challenge, incredible teams, incredible man manipulation, but there was still almost no feedback anywhere on any of the teams, right? So you got to see things like the robot going and completely missing the object it was trying to pick up, which is sort of forgivable, perception's hard. What's unforgivable, in my opinion, is now if you continue to do the task, as if you still have the object in your hand and go off and do it. So I think there's a big part that's missing from manipulation, which is to, to stabilize um, the dynamics of a manipulation task with feedback control. And to just give a teaser about that, here's a, a more sort of contact-rich, dynamical uh, maneuver on a couple of, of arms where the simulation is matching reality very well. And we'll talk a lot more about how do you plan rich contact mechanics type maneuvers and stabilize them on a real robot. Okay, so if you go to autonomous driving, if you go to anything, you're gonna find dynamics. It might not be the, the only reason why we can't solve a problem, but the places where the, where the problems are really hard, a lot of the times the reason why that is is still because of dynamics. Okay, so the course is about that, right? The course is about making your robot do a backflips, making your albatross fly across the ocean really well. Um, it's a class about dynamics and about algorithms for dynamics. So I'm gonna try to give you um, sort of a toolbox. Jonathan Kellner teaches a class, the Algorithm Business Toolbox, Toolkit, which I think is a great name. Um, but we're gonna try to give you a toolkit so that if you have dynamics in your life, uh, then you'll have a good sense, I hope, of taking the computational approaches we know how to, that we have so far, understanding their limits, and understanding how to apply them to the problems to make your robots more dynamic. Okay, so it's about nonlinear dynamics and minimal control with algorithms. If you care about walking robots, UAVs, autonomous drivers, Driving, manipulation, you know, it should appeal, I hope. Uh, it also is just a great, if you're you know, a, a researcher, right, it's just the best problem for, for doing research, right, because you've um, you got the mathematics, beautiful underlying mathematics, super cool hardware, you know, you can come over and see a, a full-size 400-pound humanoid in our lab, and that's pretty fun, right? It's got, it's got, um, it's got flair and depth, so it's a great, it's a great set of problems. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to try to so I, I, it's interesting to teach this class. I have a couple goals, right? So sometimes we get um, computer scientists that come in who haven't thought about the dynamics part of it. We also get um, you know, mechanical type uh, uh, people or aerospace people that haven't thought as much about the algorithm side. So I try to bring these two together. And my goal is to make sure the computer scientists love dynamics when they're done and, uh, uh, and understand how the algorithms maybe they've seen or know relate to those dynamics. And the people who, haven't, who know the dynamics, and you have to already love them if you know them, uh, then they're, you're going to learn a lot of algorithms, and we're going to bring it all together. What you need for the class is um, mostly comfort with differential equations and linear algebra, and maybe Python is going to help this time. Um, it shouldn't be too bad. What you don't need is a big background in robotics, because actually uh, the robot kinematics, dynamics, some of the classical ideas of, of uh, robotics, they're fairly easy to introduce, and the software is going to take away a lot of those problems for you. Okay? Any questions on that sort of overview? Cool. Okay, so um, let's get to the definitions. <laughs> These boards are ridiculously heavy, but. Okay. Here's a sort of a preview of the type of, of equations that you're going to see in the class. Okay. Um, we're going to be thinking a lot about nonlinear differential equations. Um, I'm going to often write them in the form x dot equals f 
of x u, state space form, right? Where, uh, you know, so u is the control input. x is the state vector. A vector of real valued numbers that complete, tells me everything that's going on in the world. It's almost always real value. Um, this is a vector valued function that tells me from the state and the current control input what happens in time, right? So this is the, the, the time derivative. It's just the time derivative of the, of the, of the state, okay? We're going to focus on mechanical systems. So um, although many of the ideas apply to Fs that come from all over, but when F is the result of writing down the equations of motion from, uh, me for mechanics, you know, roughly it's going to be the result of F equals MA, then that implies a little bit more structure on F. And I'll exploit that here just to make, the, make some points, okay? So for instance, um, normally these equations become second order dynamics. Right, because uh, acceleration is, is a second time derivative. So we're going to use the notation Q for the, um, <clears throat> the position, the vector of positions, or configurations, and Q dot for velocities. Okay, and we'll end up with second order equations that are typically of the form One minor caveat, um, Q dot is often, it, it, it has some limitations. If you start thinking about 3D rotations, then you typically don't want to use the derivative of the positions as your representation for velocity. So sometimes you'll see me use V for this, especially in the software. Uh, we'll mostly use V. But the details of quaternions and other things are not essential for most of the board work we'll do in class. So I'll, and everything's just simpler if I, if I use Q dot. Okay, but just know that you might see a V in the, in the, in the code. Okay, so, um, so now we, we said it's second order. It turns out mechanical systems have even more structure. Again, just coming from F equals MA, if the force you're applying is a torque, because you have an actuator at the, a motor at the joint, then in fact, we can, torque enters the equations of motion in a particular way, you're always, affine in the controlled effort, okay? So I can even specialize this a little bit more. I'll break it down into F1 plus F2 times U. So just calling out that U enters in a particular way into these equations when it's a mechanical system and the U is torque, okay? Anytime you see a system where U enters in, uh, in, in this way, it's called a control affine system. And it has important implications uh, for what we know how to do with control. Okay, so in this case, in this form, understanding what it means to be underactuated is Crystal clear, super easy to think about. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll first define the opposite, right? So I'll say a system is fully actuated in, in configuration Q, Q dot. If um, F Q Q dot is full row rank. Why is that, why does that matter? What are the implications of that? You can see it algebraically immediately and I'll spend a few minutes trying to make you realize how uh, big of a deal that really is mechanically, okay? 
But if F2 is full row rank, then what it means is that there is uh, an inverse that exists. So let me just make sure that this makes sense to you, right? So um, first we'll just say the dimension of Q, let's call that N, okay? Uh, the dimension of U, let's call that M, right? So F2, this thing, it's a function, right? But it's a function that outputs a vector uh, the uh, matrix that lives in Rn by M, right? It's an Rn by M matrix. So I want the rank of that matrix to be equal to N. I know it can't be more than N, right? It could be less than N, for sure. So if this rank is n, then that implies that the system is fully actuated. So why is that such a big deal? Basically, that's the conditions that, that are required for, um, for that system, that f, to have an inverse, right? It doesn't have to have a unique inverse. It could be, it could, it could be that m is bigger than n, okay? But there is some inverse mapping that exists as long as that holds. So that if I have a desired Q double dot, there is some U that I can do to basically, ultimately, and we'll see this play out, that I can command any Q double dot I want with U. I have enough power to take over my dynamics. I have enough you know, rank to take over my, my uh, dynamics. The definition now of an underactuated system follows, right? So. If I drop rank, then I'm suddenly underactuated. Now, because F2, Q, Q dot, is a function of the, of the state, there's a, this definition is actually a state-dependent definition. I could be underactuated sometimes and not always. But in practice, all the robots we're going to write down, that tends to be a property of the entire system. So we'll say that if, if for all Q and Q dot, this thing has low rank, then I'm going to call the system, the whole system underactuated. Okay? Now, it's interesting to think about this a little bit. So, um, so you, you tend to have, you know, how, how many actuators do you tend to have compared to your, uh, your joints, right? So a robot arm on the, on the factory floor, you typically put one motor per joint, right? Uh, so M equals N, and you have a pretty good chance, unless you do something pretty wrong with the way you wire up your motors, of F being full rank, and you're gonna be a fully actuated robot. That changes now if you're a humanoid robot and you're not bolted to the ground. You have a certain number of links on your robot. You could probably put a motor on all of them. Uh, you, you, sometimes there's clever reasons why you wouldn't want to. But you also have a few new degrees of freedom that the robot arm on the factory floor didn't have. You have a floating base coordinate, right? You have the position of your robot in space. And you don't have an actuator that can completely control that. So no matter what I do, uh, you know, I have actually, in, in my case, uh, in your case, uh, we have lots and lots of muscles. We have redundant actuation, right? So M is actually bigger than N. But despite having all those muscles, hundreds of muscles in my body, as soon as I jump off the ground, there's nothing, barring any aerodynamic effects, there's nothing that those motors can do, those muscles can do, that's gonna affect the ballistic trajectory of my center of mass, right? So I become under, I am underactuated, and it's revealed in particular when I'm flying through the air. Okay, so um, there's a there's a more general definition of underactuated, but this is enough for us to see the power. So. Let me show you how to abuse that power with a tool called feedback linearization.
So the first thing to observe is that um, you know, we talked about nonlinear differential equations, but there's a world out there of linear differential equations, which typically will take the form x dot equals ax plus bu, right? Um, we know a lot about how to control these things. We know very little about how to control, relatively, about how to control these things. Unless they're fully actuated, okay? Then, um, basically, you can replace this with this. You have enough control authority to turn your horribly ugly nonlinear system into something that's much easier. And then you can bring all of your tools from linear systems theory to, to bear on the problem. Okay, so um, feedback linearization. So if I, if I go back to my, my standard form here, control affine form. Let's say I have, um, I'm de I have a desired acceleration that I'd like my system to experience. I'll call it Q double dot. Desired superscript, that's okay. And what if I just choose this as my control law? U equals F2 inverse Q, Q dot. By assumption, with fully actuated systems, this thing exists, right? Q double dot desired minus F1 Q, Q dot. If I plug this into my equations, F2 cancels this, this cancels this, and the thing that comes out the end is Q. The actual acceleration perfectly tracks the desired acceleration. There's no, quite, there's no statement here about how much control effort was required, and in fact, a lot of times the numbers become be pretty big, but if I have a leg that wants to swing forward like a multi-link pendulum, and I have enough motors and a, a sort of rigid base, if I apply enough torque, I can make that thing do whatever I want it to do, right? At some cost. The cost is pretty severe, so ASIMO, the number, the, we've run more efficiency numbers on ASIMO than on any other robot, but ASIMO uses about 20 times as much energy as a human when we walk. If you just do the cost of transport analysis, the scaled uh, performance of moving a mass over a certain distance, energy in, about 20 times worth uh, more energy required. Now, the Boston Dynamics robots are even more than that, but that's just because they're using hydraulics. Uh, and I think the future will we'll start getting these numbers down, but right now you're paying a pretty big penalty to be walking like this. Okay. Now, it's important to, to realize this is still, um, th this is now a trivial decoupled linear system. It's still a second order linear system. So you can't follow any trajectory, but you can, you can, you know, in phase space, you can't, you know, go the wrong way in phase space or something like this, but you can command any acceleration. And you could think of this now as a second order linear system and bring PD control, PID control, uh, linear optimal control, all these tools to bear on this problem, okay? Now, <clears throat> rank is one way that uh, you can break feedback linearization. If you drop rank, then this controller doesn't exist or would ask for infinite, you know, the, numerically would ask for infinite torque. There are other things that can sort of break that simple control idea. ways to break so if you have input saturations that's one real way that it happens although the quad rotors you know basically have infinite force, and that atlas that's doing a backflip has effectively infinite force. So input saturations are more of a problem for some than others, but this could look like, for instance, torque limits. Which I, 
I might write, for instance, as saying that that is bounded by some, you know, some domain. Okay. Uh, if you have state constraints, like you're not allowed to punch through the wall or through the ground, that's another way that they'll come in and complicate these controllers. Doesn't always invalidate them. Um, the other big one that I assumed here, and I wondered if someone would call me on it, is this only works if you know your model perfectly, right? So if you have any model uncertainty, then this doesn't work out of the box, but actually people know how to make that work pretty well. And, you, and there's some really strong results that sort of take this and push it through the adaptive control world in order to have provably stabilizing uh, control for, for manipulation, or for, for, for fully actuated robots. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> some of these are about dynamics, some of them are about uncertainty, that's a little bit different, right? But the slightly generalized notion of, un of under actuation then, If I have some complicated function, let's say it's not um, control affine. It could be time dependent. It could even be higher order. Okay, but what matters is for the highest derivative, whatever the highest derivative I, I, I care about, does there exist a mapping such that for every desired uh, higher order derivative, the highest order derivative, does there exist a U that allows that to happen? Okay, and I write that. I wrote that carefully in the notes for you. Okay, so does the, is that map surjective from U to is there does there always exist a way to produce arbitrary accelerations in this case? So in the case of input saturations, input saturations break that. So I would consider an input saturated system to be under actuated. Model uncertainty is a different idea. State constraints are slightly different idea, but. Um, but there's a core general idea of underactuation is can you command arbitrary accelerations? So all of these things, all these complexities and maybe real world efficiency limits, they're, you know, it's always good to think about, even if your system is fully actuated, it's, it's good to think about dynamics and try not to cancel them out with high, you know, this is maybe a painful controller to use. Um, these are the conditions that mean you have no choice, you have to think about the dynamics. Somehow the simple controls, control law doesn't work and it's uh, the, sort of the joke is that the reason there's a field called underactuated uh, control is, is roughly that if you're a control theorist, you know, this is just too appealing. And so you have to actually take away the ability to, to, to do it in order to inspire new control approaches like it. So that's why underactuated sort of got called out. Uh, you should, you know, these are, these are good ideas and we'll exploit them to some extent. There might be times where you'd like to cancel out your dynamics or re replace them gently with something else. Uh, you should use these when, when, when they're available. But in the underactuated systems, they are not available, right? I have a, a witty colleague who likes to ask me, he said, Russ, if you had more research funding, would you work on fully actuated robots? And so, the answer is no, but, uh, but it's a pretty good joke. And you should be able to defend that by, you know, if, if you're asked on the street now. Okay, so um, what I want to do now is, is uh, give you a little bit of a, sort of a flavor of, of what robot dynamics look like in these form, how they fall into this form, and to some extent expose you to it so that you don't have to think about it later in, in the class. But I want you to see where the equations we're going to be working um, through in the class come from. <laughs> because they're really not scary. Um, I find some people come into the class and they sort of don't think they know mechanics or something like this, but if you see the origin story, it's pretty trivial. And uh, I think you'll feel pretty comfortable with it. <clears throat> okay, so you know, how do we generate the equations of emotion for our robots, right? Just. To 
pull out a little bit more, I'll use this as an excuse to show off a little bit more of the structure that you get for, uh, from your robot equations. Okay, so let me just do a quick exercise here of how would you, if, you have, if someone were to give you a, a double pendulum here, okay, with say theta one, theta two as the, the joint angles. I'll put a mass one here. I'll, I'll lump all of the mass at two points because that makes the equations easier. Length one, length two. Gravity's pointing down, okay? So everything you need to know about robotics for this class is sort of fits on a board. Kinematics are trivial, so if I would like to understand the position of mass one and mass two, I'll write that down as the position of mass one. It's, it's going to be an xy position, a two-dimensional you know, two uh, number, which is the xy sort of coordinates of this, of this mass. And I could just, that's just basic trigonometry, right? So as I've defined it, it's L1 sine theta 1 and negative L2 cosine theta 1. And we're going to shorthand all the time. I, won't, I almost didn't remember to do it, but I'll write that down as L1 S1. These are all in the notes too, so don't feel like you have to copy it down. L1C1, okay? Just use shorthand sine theta one is, sine, is S1, okay? Um, I can do the same thing for, for the position of coordinate two, it's the position of coordinate one plus the L2 sine of theta one plus theta two, negative cos theta one plus theta two, Okay, which I can shorthand as S1 plus two and the like, okay? Now how do I get the equations of motion? That's most of what I need to get the equations of motion. I can take the derivatives of that. I can figure out what P1 dot is. I get a L1 theta dot cosine theta one, sine theta one. If I just take the derivative of that, I can similarly take the derivative to get the velocities of P2, it's P1 dot plus, right? <clears throat> and that now is enough for me to write the kinetic energy. Which in a slightly general form, so I'm gonna use it. Um, well, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll save that for a second. I can write it already with these. Okay, so um, P1 dot, this is maybe not quite the way you're used to seeing it, but this is just one half mv squared with the vector form of, of v squared plus one half m2 v squared. And I can write the potential energy. Which is gonna be M1 G with Y1, which would be negative L1 cosine theta. Plus the M2 G times the Y position of Theta two, which I'll just call it y two for here. Save myself some writing. Once you have the kinetic and potential energy, then you invoke Lagrangian mechanics. You turn a little crank, so the the Lagrangian is called is and and again it's it, so. You, the point is just to show this to you, but even if you, if you don't know it, I'm, I'm not teaching it but uh, this quickly, but I just want you to know that it's not, it's not that scary. This is, you can think of this as just a, um, an algebraic tool. If I define some function L is kinetic energy minus potential energy, and I start taking some derivatives, Or 
this is L here, and this is just a generalized force. That's my control effort input or something coming in. It's a general force on coordinate I. When I get one of these equations for each I, which in this case, Q is theta 1, theta 2, I can, I can take that a set of equations, take some derivatives with respect to theta 1, another set with respect to theta 2, and I get two equations that pop out. Those two equations look like that, okay? Nothing scary. You can see how these numbers here, if you just take some derivatives, could give you two equations that look like that. Okay, and actually all the steps are worked out in the notes if you want, if you'd like to find, so if, if you haven't done this a lot before, it's a good exercise to just walk through that once to make sure you're comfortable with it. The great thing is that if you do it enough times and enough people, there's smart people that, that have, have done this a lot of times for us and realized that the equations that pop out for lots of different robots, they all have a very standard form. Okay, so I'm going to abstract this away. We're never going to have to write the complexity of, those, of that level of equations again because there's a very standard form that they always land. And that standard form has enough structure that we're going to be able to leverage it for many, many different robots all the time. So if you look at that equation for a minute, you'll see that there's Q double dot. On the left, right, it's always multiplied by something that looks like a mass, all the Q double dots. You could imagine arranging it into a vector form. And in fact, even for general, more complicated multi-link robots, that, um, that form takes this sort of, this thing called the manipulator equations. This general form. And this will be the standard form that we're going to leverage over and over in the class. So always when I kick these out, I get something that looks like some function, which is gen it's the generalized mass matrix or the inertia matrix times my Q double dots. Okay. Now there's a couple other acceleration related uh, inertial forces that come out as your Coriolis and centripetal forces. So we'll put those on this side of the equation too. And it turns out they're actually quadratic in velocity, always. But I don't want to get into tensors, so I'm just going to call, and it's enough for us, for most of our derivations, to just point out that it's, it's linear in Q dot, which reminds us, this structure just reminds us quickly that uh, if Q dot is zero, if the velocity is zero, then those terms do nothing. Okay, so these are the sort of Coriolis centripetal terms. Okay, and then the forces, those are our accelerations, and our F, F equals MA, so this is an MA, and our forces, I have some forces that come in that are due to gravity. I'm going to call them generalized torques instead of forces, so I'll use tau for any torques, okay. Gravity nicely only depends on positions. It doesn't depend on velocity. And then maybe the most important thing of all here is that my torques that I apply at the joints always comes in like this. Okay, so this is my gravity vectors. This is my input torques. This is a uh, torque to generalized coordinates mapping. This equation is the governing equation for almost all of our robots. Sometimes we have additional constraints on it. If you have a four bar linkage or if you have a floor that you're not allowed to penetrate, you can get additional terms that will enforce those constraints. But this is the, the, the basic structure. 
I can write it even more like my second order control affine system, right? Because I could always, the great thing about this inertial matrix, in fact, we know, we, there's lots of things we know about this. So for instance, I could have written the kinetic energy, the general form of the kinetic energy is in fact Q dot MQ Q dot. That it's, it is, that's why you can think of it as a mass matrix, okay? And maybe then if you, if you see that, you could believe me just on physical intuition that M is always positive. You don't get negative energy ever, although that would be cool. Um, so in fact, we know that M is always positive definite. So we know that M actually has an inverse. That's a cool thing to know. <clears throat> we know some things about how M and C relate. But let's exploit the fact that we know that M is positive. The problem with these beautiful, clean new boards is that they're clean exactly once and then worse than if they were dirty to begin with. I can write my dynamics now as my second order system. Q double dot is just, I'm gonna take my M inverse here, since M is invertible, times all my other terms here. So I've got a tau G Q plus V U minus C Q Q dot Q dot. And it's right back to my second order dynamics form that I talked about before. All right, question. What is the criteria now that depend, that'll tell me if my, system, if my robot, which has the manipulator equations, is fully actuated? It's control affine, right? So that simple form works. Exactly. This is always invertible. It's always full rank. So we can tell everything if we just look at the rank of B, right? So it's fully actuated. If B is full row rank. Okay, so let me just remind you of how powerful that is uh, and how you can actually sort of abuse it, um, right? Okay, so here's a simple example of just simulating the dynamics of that double pendulum, okay? That's just with zero torque. And these, this is, a, you know, the Python libraries will be available for you. And the cool thing is, you do this once, and now, uh, you know, the software will come up with M, C, tau, D for you. You just write down the description, the skeleton of your robot, and it'll kick those equations out. And in fact, there's beautiful recursive forms of those rigid body dynamic algorithms, so people know how to do that really efficiently and the like. Okay, but if I want to do something different to that, if I want to just say, okay, I've got a double pendulum, someone gave me a double, double pendulum, but I've got torques with unlimited power at both joints, I can make that double pendulum do whatever I want within two dimensions, right? So, for instance, if I want to make that um, act like a single pendulum, I can do that, right? So, uh, I can just add in a term, a control term U, which if B is invertible, I, I'll just add tau G, or I'll I mean, I'll subtract tau G, I'll add C, I'll multiply the whole thing by M, so that, invert, that cancels, and I'll get, end up with whatever dynamics I want. So I'll put in the dynamics of a single pendulum, right? And I can do that, so. <clears throat> right, you can take your original system and turn it into whatever you want within the, confines of living in two dimensions because you've only got two joints. In fact, if you wanted to, uh, 
invert gravity, you could. So there's nothing stopping you, right? Oh, now I'm an unstable pendulum. Look at me, right? Or uh, it's stable to, to the upright. That's fine. If you wanted to uh, pretend gravity didn't exist, you could do that too. And now you're a pendulum in space, <laughs> right? So uh, it's a powerful tool. You should use it when it makes sense, but don't abuse your power. It's, um, you should feel bad whenever you use it. Okay, does that make sense? People have a sense for, uh, you know, the basic tools of the class? And the basic, uh, the, you should know what underactuated means at this point, right? So, it, okay, what happens? So, so someone comes along on the street and says, I heard you're taking underactuated robotics. What does that even mean? Okay, so you've now got a few options, right? You could perform a backflip and, uh, you know, <laughs> that would be good. You could, uh, you could give them the theorem, right? Uh, you have my blessing to use the control affine form. That's people get that faster, so you're, that's at your disposal. I also think you could uh, pick sort of any household object, right? And maybe close your eyes for a fact, and, and then just turn it over, ah, yeah, and then see what see how they react. And if they're not impressed, then uh, send them to me, and I'll, we'll deal with it. Okay, so you, I hope you know sort of the rough idea of the class now, but let me tell you sort of specifically how we're going to dive in uh, for the rest of the term. <clears throat> so I believe in playing with the dynamics, I mean the, the simulation kind of tools of just being able to take a simple model, watch it behave, muck with the parameters, watch it behave, that's a super important learning tool. I mean, I. I get a lot of my intuition by playing with, with those tools. Uh, you know, there's little things like uh, we go to length to make sure that that simulation plays back at real time. I mean, that's not hard to do, but sometimes people don't do that and it bugs the snot out of me because you, you lose all of your phys physical intuition, right? So, so it's, I think you can watch these things and if you're mechanically inclined or whatever, that you can get a lot of intuition by playing with the, with the tools. <clears throat> But a lot of the systems that we talk about, we're gonna talk about tools that are gonna work for making Atlas do a backflip, um, but we can get a lot more intuition if we start with simple models first and understand the simplest version of the problem that we really care about, understand how the dynamics work on that. Maybe we can plot everything about it, sometimes. Maybe we can solve equations in closed form, sometimes. And in many cases, uh, you know, we've tried to pick the ones that are gonna, uh, those insights will transfer back to the big system. So the plan for the course, we're gonna start off with, with simple systems, very simple systems, so I'll actually go backwards to like the simple pendulum first. But I will, I'll use this to talk about nonlinear dynamics. Make sure you understand what, what fixed points are, what Lyapunov stability is, these kind of some of these classical notions that we'll, we'll build on uh, <clears throat> with some really simple systems that we can understand the equations. Okay, then we're gonna get, so there's, there's a class, there's like a batch of systems that people would call the canonical underactuated systems. So, um, or the model underactuated systems. Having so named the course, I'm, I feel duty bound to make sure you know what those are. Otherwise, um, yeah, that, that would be bad if you didn't know sort of the canonical underactuated system. So those are like the cart poles of the world. Now you put an inverted pendulum on a base. There's there's a double pendulum that's missing an actuator. You can have um, quad rotors. This is my the fastest way I found to draw a quad, quad rotor. Um, okay, but those teach, we're going to be able to think about how to do um, stabilization. What does stability mean for these systems? Trajectory optimization, stabilization. But we're also going to pull in, so these are sort of numerical, generic things. Um, and also we'll, we'll do even sums of squares optimization if any of you know what that is yet. If you don't, you will soon. On these simple systems, optimization. But we'll also take it as an opportunity to learn some of the domain specific ideas here. There's a notion of partial feedback linearization. There's notions of differential flatness that, you'll, that people know about these systems. And 
you'll see how those connect to the computation. And then it turns out if you want to start thinking about walking systems, um, they're not a far cry from, from these. The simplest walking systems, the simplest models of these like passive dynamic walkers actually just look like a two-link pendulum that can fall down a ramp. And we'll, do, um, we'll go progress from that into the sort of the canonical walking and running systems. That's going to teach you about, that's the way I, I choose to introduce hybrid dynamics, contact mechanics, and some of the joys therein. Um, the ideas of, of limit cycle stability and some of the other ideas that are, uh, are involved in walking. We'll go from there to sort of scale up to more complex systems. So I don't know a great way to draw manipulation or humanoids or, well, both the time and my art skills do not permit. But we'll ramp up to more complexity. And in general, as we go out, we're going to have systems that are more demanding for our computation. So some of the algorithms that work down here, maybe survive here, are not going to work anymore here. And we're going to have to go to new classes of algorithms that might solve less of the problem or to less uh, satisfying conclusions. But they will scale better to more complex systems and more um, <clears throat> complex um, sort of scenarios. So we'll talk about motion planning in the context of these types of dynamics um, with convex, non, non, you know, non-convex constraints, collision avoidance, and the like. Uh, sometimes we'll get into some sort of mixed integer convex optimization and other tools like that. And then <clears throat> the next spiral out in complexity is if you give up knowing the dynamics perfectly and admit that there's uncertainty in the real world and or even uh, stochasticity in the dynamics. So we'll get into stochastic systems. Um, I do have a picture for that, but you'd laugh at me. Uh, so, uh, but this will give us some of the, the core ideas from robust control and stochastic control in this context and planning under uncertainty. And then the last spiral, which I'll take over here, is now, um, okay, I'll draw a fish. This is um, it's a happy fish with a fin and something like this. So model, th these are dynamics that are hard to model, okay? Some people think manipulation is that. Some people think autonomous driving is that, for instance, okay? but. I drew a fish. So, um, and now you have to give up even more tools uh, and, and start thinking about what happens if F is potentially wild, wildly unknown. It could be that I don't even know what the position vector is, what the state vector of the system is. And then you start giving, getting into reinforcement learning. Especially model-free methods. We'll do the shallow version and the deep version of that. If you, so that's, that's actually kind of a funny thing. So since the last time I taught the course, deep learning happened. Um, so it's not kind of screwed everything up. It just it screwed up my syllabus, but it, um, it's good for everything else. Uh, so, but, so we're going to call out to deep learning and understand how it works into this throughout. Um, <clears throat> but actually, deep learning doesn't work very well for these systems yet. It will. And I think the way to make it do that is by understanding some of the, um, the underlying mathematics and, and pushing that and bringing sort of deep learning and model-based ideas together. So that's a journey we get to go on together this year. People have questions about that? Anything you wish, you know, like it's not on, I mean I wrote almost everything possible in robotics up here, but if you, if you have one that wasn't, didn't make the list, uh, call it out or let me, or send me an email or something. Cars. Cars, yeah. So, so uh, there's two, what, which kind of car? So there's uh, the dynamics of the car, right? If you want to make a car, uh, you know, drive on two wheels instead of four or, or you know, uh, skid steer into a parking, you know, you know, drifting or something like this. That's one, an that's one sort of underactuated problem. The other one is reasoning about all the dynamics of all the guys, other people on the road. And that is also r very related. So if you, you know, especially if you have uncertainty about the, 
the other drivers on the road, uncertainty about their models, can I make some prediction about um, my actions not leading to a crash? Right? So there's, there's multiple levels of this. Both of them become relevant. Which one did you mean? The first one. The first one. Okay, well, just drifting or something like that. So I'll make sure the simulator can do that, but, uh, but <laughs> it should. In fact, it's actually easier to make it do that than to roll. Um, so I think that'll work, right? I think uh, some of you have experience with that. Um, <laughs> anything else? Yeah. Uh, what about uncertainties in your understanding of the world, so your perception? So made a conscious decision to, to call out. So we're going to do um, sensor-driven control, but probably those sensors are not going to be pixels just because there's a, that's a whole can of worms, and uh, uh, so I, I actually think if we do the math right here, then we'll change the way we do perception. Um, we're going to connect to all those things, but I'm not going to be talking about um, the actual perception part of it. Uh, you know, the, the scene understanding, object recognition, those will be sort of assumed as, as the inputs to this. Just a draw box somewhere, right? But, but for manipulation, that's core. That's, I mean, there's, there's no question that, that that's a key element for accomplishing complex manipulation tasks. I do actually think, though, that um, you, we would be a heck of a lot better at manipulation if we just had much more rich feedback control ideas. So, so if I think about looking at a table, figuring out what I want to manipulate, and deciding what, what to do when, that's not sort of what this class is going to teach you. But once you go out to reach and touch something, you want to make sure you make, get it in your hand. Maybe you want to, um, you know, use the table to actually reorient it in your hand or something like that, those kind of things are going to be very closely related to what we do. Yeah? So walking, how much do you have to adjust the algorithm for different terrains? It's good. So uh, we will, I think we'll, we'll sufficiently address that. Um, but assuming the perception system. So, so, so assuming that someone told me exactly what the terrain is, then I think the algorithms will be pretty, pretty complete and pretty satisfying in terms of, uh, as long as you don't mind your center of mass staying roughly constant, even on the terrain, uh, they'll, be, they'll be doing pretty well there. Awesome. Another great example of an underactuated system are rockets. Rockets. And uh, as far as we know, the way that SpaceX does is propulsive landing is with you know, director. All right. Falcon Heavy just launched. Oh, Falcon Heavy. <laughs> Great. My TAs are watching YouTube. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> wait, wait, wait to be a role model. We're about to try to land three cores at once. Okay. It should be. It's a really awesome interaction control problem. Okay. Also Fair. Large. You're forgiven. Okay. Um, all right. So, quick logistics. So, um, go to the website, which I've erased at this point, but. Please go to the website. It's not hard to remember. Underactuated.mit. Oh, one thing I should say is that uh, every spell checker ever wants to put a hyphen there because underactuated is not a word, right? But I've, I, come on, if I'm going to name a whole course around it, I get to say that's a real word, a proper noun. Get that hyphen out of there so there's no hyphen in there uh, and your spell checkers are going to hate you for it. But. So go to the website. Um, in particular, we're going to use Piazza for there, so there's a link there. So the, the, the action item is please sign up for Piazza uh, so you get our first announcements. Uh, the PSAT will be released tonight or tomorrow, probably tomorrow, and uh, will be due a week from then. And it's just uh, it's going to cover the material that we talked about today. Make sure you understand and are prepared to answer questions if someone approaches you. Uh, and please do, since I'm not, I, uh, I, I'm not actually passing out the grading policy in paper form because that's just a lot of paper. But it's up on the website, and please do review the, the consider it given to you. And that if you have any questions about that, uh, let me know. See you Thursday.